Hello there. Thank you so much for watching CNBC Africa, where we are fast in business worldwide. My name is Eugene Anangwe. Now, in this particular special, we're going to be focusing on a very crucial leader of a very crucial institution. Now, Trademark East Africa's Patience Mutesi is the Rwanda Country Director for Trademark East Africa, the largest aid for trade organization that actually aims at growing prosperity in East Africa through increased trade. Our institution started operations in 2010. In this special edition of Captains of Industry, we will be looking through the journey of Trademark East Africa in Rwanda through the eyes of patients. <music> Perfect. So thank you so much, Patience, for making time to speak to us thank here you for having on me, CNBC Jen. Africa. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot has been happening from the field of, uh, you know, trade across the region. And of course, you as Trademark East Africa mm -hmm. have been having a hand in one way or another. Talk to us a bit about um, how much uh, the Trademark East Africa is so far doing. And probably if you look back, do we see any dividends? Yeah. Uh, and if you can actually try to report to us some of the uh, fruits that this kind of initiatives that you've been working on uh, over this past period of time have been actually yielding. Excellent. Um, in terms of results, what we have achieved, um, you know the trademark started operations in Rwanda in 2010. Mm -hmm. So we had our first phase of programming up to 20, 2017. So right now we're in our second phase of programming. We're busy designing, busy starting implementation of the, of the program strategy too. But in terms of what we were able to achieve in strategy one, I mean, the results were impeccable. Mm -hmm. First of all, when we started out, the plan was for us to reduce the time and cost it takes to trade in, in, in East Africa. Mm -hmm. And with that, you expect that if the time goes down, the cost goes down, trade will automatically increase. Right. So in how we measured that is we assessed the transport costs and realized that that's where the greatest potential was to reduce the transport costs. Mm -hmm. At the time that we started our, our, our program in 20 2011, it used to cost about 6,500 to import a 40-foot container. Mm -hmm. At the end of strategy two, we were down to 4,500. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're down to about 3,800. Yeah. So you can see that there's been a significant reduction in the cost. In terms of time, it used to take even up to 11 days for a container to get to Rwanda. Mm -hmm. Right now, five days, you have a container in why, Rwanda. Why were we not able to do this during those times, 2011, 2012? Why did it have to take us all this time? What probably what I'm trying to ask is, what are those, you know, stumbling blocks that we've had to knock off over this time yeah. that were actually standing in the way of trade? I think it's all about um, uh, the initiatives that are taken. Uh, at, at the leadership level. At the time, we're talking about Rwanda joining the EAC much later than Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania. Um, I think there was a lack of an organization, a real aid for trade organization. So trademark is, is one of the like in Rwanda and, and, and in, in East Africa. And our mandate is to remove trade barriers. Mm. If you look before 2010, there was no such organization. Yeah. So it's just because I think, you know, trademark came in obviously with a very strong mandate from the ESC secretariat to remove trade barriers and that's why there was a renewed focus. Over time the program has re evolved on one on one side I was talking about the transport costs, I was talking, there's also non-tariff barriers, removal of non-tariff barriers. If you look at the Rwanda program specifically, in the first phase of um, our work we, re we, we facilitated the re re removal of about 23 non-tariff barriers. In terms of putting standards in place, mm -hmm. if you look at Rwanda we didn't really have, I mean the Rwanda Standards Board was in place but lacked capacity in so many ways. Yeah. So supporting them also on the standards work, supporting the trade uh, policy side of it, making sure that the regulations that we have are facilitative of trade. So all these things brought together have impacted have impacted in an increased trade um, for Rwanda. For Rwanda. Right. Uh, you not only suppose as Trademark East Africa, now I'm talking about the overall uh, uh, mandate of Trademark East Africa, is to also overlook the entire region. Yeah. And when we try to look back, uh, especially when it comes to performance of different countries across the region, when it comes to uh, making trade easier or business easier, yeah. the countries are not performing at the same level. Yeah. You know, Rwanda is now 29th uh, globally, yeah. uh, but of course Kenya did improve, but yeah. we have other countries in East Africa that are that not are actually good. moving. Uh, right. We have Burundi, which has actually been seen uh, at the bottom of the pyramid. Yeah. So how then? Do we move as a block mm. from the trademark East Africa's point of view? What mm. then needs to be done? So at the end of the day, we have to recognize that although 
I mean, EAC is, is a regional block. At the end of the day, we have countries that are independent mm. in their own right. Um, they will make reforms as they deem fit. Um, so the pace will always be different. Mm -hmm. And I take care of Rwanda, so it's very difficult to also t talk about, about all the other countries. countries. Right. I mean, the, the beauty about this country is that you have a, a, a government that is very forward looking, not that the other governments are not mm -hmm. forward looking, but they're really keen on making sure that the business environment works. Mm -hmm. And that's basically because you, if you don't have too many things working for you, 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 you know, you don't have the luxury to sit back and let things happen on their own. Mm. You need to make sure that uh, the, the, the environment is conducive enough to attract people. If right. there's nothing else to attract people, you need the environment to, mm. to attract mm. people. Mm. So that's the beauty about what's happening in Rwanda. In the other countries, I think uh, Kenya, like you said, is, has made great progress. Uganda has made progress in some, in some areas and maybe declined in others. But um, if, if I could go to, to the doing business re reform yeah. specifically, the one that we have chosen to focus on as trademark East Africa is trading across borders. Mm. Um, so removal of, uh, of reduction of the processes, making sure that it's a lot easier for traders to get their goods, both goods that are coming in and those that are coming out across borders much faster. Mm. And we've registered huge successes. Mm. Of all the, the one-stop border posts that we have funded, we funded about 13 across EAC. Mm. We've registered an average of about 50% uh, average for all of them. But in some border posts like um, Busia, we've seen a cost, re a time reduction of about 75%. Yeah. So if it was taking you a, a, a day or, or two days to cross a border, now it's taking you 75% less time, yeah. which is huge in terms of the time, the cost that you save as a business. Yeah. So that should translate into more trips, it should translate into higher trading volumes, and we're expecting that, you know, that will be the end goal. That's the end goal, but when we talk of trade volumes, a lot of has still been uh, said concerning trade among East African members, uh, it is actually reported to be reducing. And, and, yeah. and a lot of that expectation that you have is, is actually being sort of impacted yeah. uh, by, by this. Uh, talk to me about how that makes you feel, first of all, as an institution yeah. aimed at actually fa fostering trade ac across uh, the East African community and what needs to be done moving forward. Yeah. Um, obviously, our end goal, the, the end goal that we want to achieve is increased trade. So every time there's um, a political decision that uh, impacts trade negatively, it impacts our work ne negatively as well. But we, we have to also be very careful in, in assessing some of these barriers uh, that are being set up. Sometimes there are tr tariff barriers, and I truly believe that, you know, Th that's not something that we have much control over. Mm. Um, we have specifically chosen to focus on uh, on non-tariff barriers yeah. and some technical barriers along the way. And where we can, um, we focus our energies on on advocacy. Um, you know, making sure that uh, the voice of the private sector is heard and that these barriers are removed. But at the end of the day, um, we see progress. The Unfortunately, you'll see progress one day and then yeah, the next day something happens steps and so many us back. steps back. Yeah. But I think overall, since we started our program, we've seen good progress in terms of uh, increased trade in the, in the region. Right. Before I let you go, technology is one thing that actually has, has been uh, you know, incorporated or is actually being incorporated in most of the businesses that people are doing today. Cross-border traders, mostly women for instance, uh, are said to be or might miss out on this opportunity of technological evolution. And what we're talking about now is probably the fourth industrial revolution. Yeah. Let's, let's now link it to yeah. doing business. Let's link it to cross-border trade. How are things looking at? How do we ensure that we don't leave anyone behind? Yeah, I think that's that's a very good question, Eugene. And I, my personal thinking is that it's very dangerous if you try to move people from level one to mm -hmm. le level four. Leapfrogging is always a good thing, but I think we need to think about how to gradually move uh, this, the business people. In specifically, in this case, we're talking about cross-border traders, mm -hmm. moving them a, a notch higher. So, in in our first phase of work, we helped in supporting them to to be in cooperatives. But one of the things that we we realized, among many other things, is the lack 
of information. Mm. So we've been thinking about um, how to leverage technology to make information more available for these cross-border traders. Yeah. And right now we're designing a program where um, across ESC, women will be able to get information on their gadgets mm. wherever they are. Because mm. the, unfortunately, the unfortunate thing is that these women are very busy either with house chores yeah. and then trading so they don't have so much time to go out there and look uh, look, look for information yeah. so we want to make sure that information is available at their fingertips yeah. we are going to design a project where um, if you're a woman who is trading in, say, Rubavu, and you need to export to, say, Kisoro in Uganda, you're able to get a check on your on your uh, on your phone, and you're able to see what the price of maize is in uh, in uh, Kisoro, so that you're able to make a business Some decision: decision yeah. Do I export to uh, to Goma or do I send my goods to Kisoro? Right. So that's going to help. I think that's a good first step. And you know we are adaptive as we go along. When we pick up a need, we will design um, interventions to to resolve that need. Right. So about two point four million dollars, if I'm not wrong, yeah. is actually going to be invested in uh, supporting local business uh, enterprises here right. in Rwanda yeah. to be able to be smart enough yeah. to actually access international markets. Uh, take us through why this move and what would be the possible end results. Yeah. Um, why this move? First of all, the government of Rwanda has in their national strategy for transformation um, a, a goal to increase exports by about 17% per annum. Um, it's very easy to think about the reforms that need to be made so that that 17% per annum growth can be achieved. But, and it's, it's easy to ignore the fact that there are actually micro issues. Mm -hmm. uh, there are issues with these farms. So we've done assess an assessment on what the challenges of these exporting farms are. Mm -hmm. The challenges are multiple. Mm -hmm. the, the export networks are really weak. Um, there's lack of information of what the requirements on, in, on, you know, in the markets that they're trying to access, what the requirements are. Yeah. Um, there are issues around non-tariff barriers. There are issues around access to information. There's issues around access to finance. So we've designed this project um, in a way that those issues will be resolved. Mm -hmm. So it's actually farm level support where technical assistance will be provided to a mm -hmm. farm. Mm -hmm. So it's bespoke solutions yeah. for farms. Yeah. You go in there and assess the farm. Do you have export uh, strategies, first of all? Do you have the right skills? Mm. What markets are you exporting to? So what these will goods be grants, loans? What is no, it? it's technical assistance. Technical assistance. It's technical so assistance. you will be using these funds, or these funds will be used to pay the experts who will come to train them. Is it how it's right? Work or if, how does if, it you, work? if you, if you, yeah, you can call it that. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the funding goes to the technical assistance, and you have somebody who is embedded within the, the exporting firm yeah. providing solutions on a day-to-day. -day. Right. So trying to help them to design export strategies, equipping them on the skills that are required for them to access markets. Um, uh, market linkages mm. actually i think that's that's the biggest component of yeah. it actually taking farms to say tanzania and say in dar salaam there's a huge opportunity for maybe water mm. uh, to export uh, in yangi water as an mm. example mm. very simple example so you take not those specific. in that kind so of you business take them to go there and link them to distributors mm -hmm. so when it, it looks like it's a one-off but yeah. what we expect is that it's a going and a growing relationship that they're going to build yeah. so they could export a value of ten thousand yeah. dollars today but if it's a contract that they have for the next three years yeah. you've actually opened a door for them right. so it's preparing them to access the markets and then actually taking them and linking them to this market so yeah. it's a market linkages program. market linkages program yeah. some of them would probably wonder and say probably you, should, you would have just cut a chunk of that money and given it to me as capital or probably some money to facilitate some of my projects. Yeah. They would want probably to look at it from that end. Probably this question is, why did probably those organizing this resort to that model yeah. as opposed to saying we will offer you grants depending on your market needs or, or your needs for your markets right. or for you to access the international markets, we'll offer you this amount of money. It's probably transport was your challenge. Give us a budget, give us a strategy, and yeah. we'll fund it. Probably yeah. why didn't we go that direction? I mean, Eugene, if you look at the funding that's available vis-a-vis -vis 40, can you imagine 40 export farms and the kind of needs they might have? Mm -hmm. It's 
with $2.4 million, there's not so much that you can you can achieve. Yeah. But the plan is also that if you're able to resolve all, this, all these things, you have export strategies, you have the skills, you have the market linkages, you have a contract that you have signed with a buyer, mm. what are the chances that you'll go to a bank through the export growth fund and not get the money. Mm -hmm. We have to remember that there's also the export growth fund. So this is, the, the, the aim of this project is to help uh, exporters to also access the export growth fund. There's a fund that's available right now that is not adequately utilized. Yeah. Um, so this is also to help them access that funding. Okay. So it's not necessarily grants and we will have other projects uh, designed in such a way that maybe they could get direct grants but this specific one is to help them to also leverage the export growth fund. Right. Patients, usually they say in most conversations, most deals, yeah. it's always a matter of give and take. Right. Trademark East Africa is giving $2.4 million. What is Trademark East Africa taking? Trademark East Africa will be getting back increased trade. That's mm. what we want to see. At the end of the day, we are an aid for trade organization. We are not for profit. We mm. don't expect anything back. But what our investors expect from us is that they will be a, a response pro from the private sector, which mm. is in the, in the um, in a way that trade will be increased. So there's increased trade, mm. and specifically for this project, it's exports, increased mm. exports. Mm. There's increased uh, jobs. So we're expecting that if a farm is exporting, say, 50,000 today, and tomorrow they're able to export uh, 500,000, that they will increase jobs. Right. Uh, so that's uh, what we want to get back. Th th there's one concern that I wouldn't want to leave us uh, without actually touching on, and that is this money, for instance, we've talked about the experts coming to actually also give expert advice to this yeah. uh, cross-border traders, uh, for them to be able to get the skills to access the international market. Some would be worried. I mean, probably this is an opportunity for you to uh, allay such kind of fears mm -hmm. that this is actually money that is just going to end up in the pockets of international consultants mm -hmm. who will then eventually just go away with this money. Mm -hmm. uh, so what will be the criteria for actually choosing these experts? And, and, and how do we assure local consultants who have the expertise, the knowledge of the context of yeah. this country, that they will be able to actually benefit from this as well? Yeah, I mean, the first way I would allay those fears is uh, by showing what we achieved in the first phase. So this phase is a second, is a second from the first. In the first, we were piloting the program and we were able to help 16 firms. If I can give you a very simple example was of, one of my favorite was of a chalk producer, a lady who had never exported out of Rwanda. Mm. But through the export uh, capability program, we linked her to buyers in Uganda. And I mean, it's, it's very simple to think that an exporter will just go and sell. It's a very complicated process because it, she was selling to the Ministry of Education in Uganda. They have requirements. They have payment mod modes mm. um, that if you don't understand, your business could very easily fail. That business was able to grow and they go to a point where I think about 80% uh, of their sales were in exports. Mm. So it's to see what we got out of the first phase. Right. Secondly, is it's I would like to also allay their fears by saying within this particular program, one of the things that we've realized is that on one end you have exporters, on the other hand you, 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 you have also um, banks that want to lend exporters, but then they just don't know how. Mm. So in this particular program, we're going to be training what we're calling export advisors, mm. so consultants. And we have a target of training about 10 of them. So this will also locals. eventually also train others, trainers Absolutely. of trainers. So it's like trainers of trainers. Mm. And what we expect is that with our export uh, capability program, it's a four-year program, uh, but exports will have to continue growing. Yeah. So what we expect is that these consultants will be training the local export advisors, and those people should have the skills to train others, but also to help these farms to continue accessing markets yeah. out, of, out of Rwanda. Yeah. And thirdly, the, the, the last thing I'd like to say is that Trademark goes through a very stringent procurement process. Right. So we make sure that the firm that is given these kinds of consultancies have the experience, they will give the value for money, value for money is a big aspect mm. uh, of, of our program, mm. and that they will actually deliver what they set out to deliver by, by virtue of what they have done in the past. Perfect. So I, I, would, I would like to allay anybody's fears uh, by telling them that um, the program is well designed and at the end of the day it, it has the interests of, of Rwandan exporters at heart. Right, if I remember well in the course of this conversation, uh, patients you mentioned that 2.4 million you might not be able to do much with all this number of people, but that's a lot of money for someone out there. And so whenever there's a 
a huge amount of money like that, there's always issues of accountability. Mm -hmm. Let's talk through about the tools that probably Trademark East Africa and the partners in this whole project have put in place mm -hmm. that will ensure that that money is actually going to the right place where it is actually supposed to be channeled. Right. Um, so I talked about procurement. I talked about, I didn't talk about this, but another thing is about um, we, we have very, very strict deliverables that we set. Mm -hmm. And those deliverables are not set by trademark. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that I would like to make very, very clear that we don't operate as a standalone organization. Mm -hmm. All our programs are implemented in partnership with government. So this particular one is embedded within RDB. So RDB will go through the selection criteria. RDB um, will be part of the panel that will, uh, that will determine the consultant that's going to do this work. Mm -hmm. RDB will set timelines and deliverables for the consultants mm. and no payment is done to this consultant unless they have delivered on XYZ. Mm. And the beauty about this is that you're talking about firms that you know you can go to and find out. Yeah. Have they actually given you a, 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 an export strategy? Have you got any training? Mm. So it's not like we're dealing with people who are far off. It's mm. people who are here we have control over and we're pretty confident that we, we will get the right firm to, to, to implement the program. Right. So do you have any worries that probably you might not be able to meet certain desired targets by certain uh, consultants and then what happens in such instances for instance do we go back to square one and say we are going to again go afresh into outsourcing for another uh, consultant to go and do this job is this what you envision? well we've not really had many cases where we've had to cancel contracts with the uh, with the consultants mm. and that's because within the office you have a program manager who is daily following up on this mm. um, also because we have very strong partnerships with the government so we always make sure that within the government we have a focal person who's following up on this mm -hmm. on these programs mm -hmm. if there was a case where we got a consultant who was not able to deliver what they set out to deliver then we have we have room within our uh, contracts mm. to cancel, mm. but it hasn't really been the case in the past mm. because of the level of um, accountability that we've had between the partners and ourselves and the consultants that we have selected. Right. So what next after here in terms of pipeline activities that yeah. are lined up after this very great initiative? What next? What else should we be looking out for Gosh, as newsmakers, news, news reporters? <laughs> there's a lot, Eugene. There's yeah. a lot that we are designing. Um, very soon we'll be great breaking ground for Lake Kivu mm -hmm. uh, to build some ports on Lake Kivu, but also to bring in private sector to operate ferry services. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll also very soon be starting uh, the consultancy for developing a one-stop border post between Rwanda and uh, DRC mm -hmm. at Rusizi 2. Mm -hmm. We are also working out a horticulture solution um, with, uh, with NAEB. Again, we're, all, we're doing all this in partnership with the government. Um, we're going to work with the ministry on the, on the trade policy side, so some technical assistance, some young professionals. Mm -hmm. I think one of the areas where we've registered really good successes is on, on the young professionals program. Mm -hmm. So we'll be providing some young professionals in this program as well. We'll have some young professionals in uh, RDB to help them enhance their capacity to be able to support um, trade-related and export development strategies. Mm -hmm. um, We'll be working with the Rwanda Standards Board to enhance their capacity to provide standard services. We will be continuing to work with RRA. We've signed an MOU with RRA um, a week or so back. Um, so we'll continue using, leveraging ICT to make um, trade processes easier for traders. And then finally, but definitely not the least, is our trade and logistics clusters mm. where we're trying to work with the government of Rwanda um, to attract foreign direct investment into export-led manufacturing activities. Mm. So if I could break that down, it's about helping them in their strategy of developing industrial parks. So we are doing some assessment on that. It's still in the primary stages, but very soon I think we'll have something big to show. Right. So there's a lot in the there's pipeline. <laughs> and of course your work is clearly well cut out. Not, <laughs> not really. <laughs> it takes a lot. I mean, things change. Yeah. Uh, um, be the beauty about it is that we have a seven-year program that yeah. is very known. Yeah. We know exactly what, what we want to do. To do. Yeah. But when it comes to implementation, things will not always go as planned. Yeah. So you need to be really, really adaptive at right. all times. Uh -huh. But thank you so much, Patience, for making You're time welcome. to speak to us. Thank you, Eugene. Asante. Asante. Asante.
Well, that's it for our special edition of Captains of Industry. Stick around on CNBC Africa for more of such conversations. As always, I'm Eugene Anangwe, signing off.